Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Early on in Being and Time, in the introduction, section 6, Heidegger is going to introduce a new key term, historicity. And he's connected this up with temporality. We shouldn't merely view this as sort of a, a new mode of temporality. Like first you've got temporality and then you add history into the mix by, you know, taking away or adding something to it. Historicity is always there as something that is characteristic, something that is essential to Dasein, even when we don't realize it, as Heidegger is going to point out. So Heidegger tells us that temporality is the condition of the possibility of historicity as a temporal mode of being of Dasein itself. That's a nice phrase there. Um, and he goes on and he says, as a determination, historicity is prior to any sort of history, whether it's world history, whether it's the history of a particular people or chronicling or anything like that. This is an existential uh, structure of Dasein itself as human being, which means that this extends back into prehistory of human beings as well. So he says, what is historicity? Historicity means the constitution of, the, of being, of the occurrence of Dasein as such. That's a little abstract, isn't it? What, what, what should we unpack that? The constitution of being, of the occurrence of Dasein. Dasein, human being, emerges as human being through having this, this dimension of historicity. Um, so he goes on and he says, this is a nice phrase, in its factual being, Dasein always is as and what it already was. A little bit later, he's going to frame this in, in a little bit more succinct terms. Dasein is its past. We exist in the present, right? But we exist as beings that have a past. Even if we, you know, look at these kind of science fiction or detective novel things of people who've got complete amnesia, they don't really have complete amnesia, which is a, a lack of memory of what occurred in the past, because they know how to use, say, a spoon, or what a spoon is, or how to speak English, or any of these sorts of things. And that can only happen by having some sort of, of past involved. Doesn't mean that all there is is the past, of course, or that the being of Dasein is only its past. So he says, whether explicitly or not it is its past, it is its own past, not only in such a way that its past, as it were, a beautiful metaphor, pushes itself along behind it, and that it possesses what is past as a property that is still objectively present and at times has an effect on it. Sort of like, you know, the fact that you have certain determinate characteristics of yourself that have been charted. And, you know, for example, right now we're, we're creating something in the present that's going to be part of a past uh, in, in creating this, this video. He says, Dasein is its past in the manner of its being, which roughly expressed on each occasion occurs out of its future. So we're constantly oriented towards a future, but we're constantly also bringing, realize it or not, a past along with us. Now you might say, okay, well, how does that get us history or historicity? Maybe I just have my own individual past. You have your own individual past. Well, it doesn't really work like that. 
It wouldn't be a coherent past. Heidegger's not really going into this in detail here, but it's worth dwelling on. It wouldn't really be a coherent past if I was isolated by myself as the only member or rememberer of that, that past. So he tells us that because of this, Dasein grows into what he calls a customary interpretation of itself and grows up in that interpretation. Now, he's not spelling this out, but typically that interpretation is, is happening through interaction with an entire world of others and perhaps even my imagination or memories of those others within my own being. So what does this give us? He says, Dasein understands itself within this interpretation at first and within a certain range constantly. So he calls this an elemental historicity of Dasein. He tells us, returning to the point of Dasein's historicity precedes history itself, that this can be easily concealed from us. As a matter of fact, many people don't realize this about themselves. It could be that in the modern era, in certain respects, we're privileged with respect to this. Uh, but, but there's also possibilities of concealment as well. So he says, Dasein can discover, preserve, and explicitly pursue something like a tradition. This is where it becomes more conscious. He says the discovery of tradition and the disclosure of what it transmits, because if you think about the nature of tradition, tradition is not just simply a monolithic thing out there that you have to bow down to and allow to imprint itself upon you. Tradition is literally the handing over of one thing uh, or multiple things from one person to another. And so who is doing the handing? What is being handed? All of these are things that can become questions for us. And tradition is itself, you might say, reinterpretive. So he goes on and he says <clears throat> that the discipline of history is possible only as a kind of being belonging to inquiring Dasein. We are the only animals that engage in history. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to mean writing history books. It can mean asking, wait a second, I thought that Uncle Fred was married to this person and uh, you know, had, had three kids with, with this person. Uh, was that all a lie? Right? That's historical in a sense. It's bringing a past into the present in such a way that it, it matters in some way. Now he says, if historicity, this dimension of historicity, uh, remains concealed from Dasein, and so long as it does so, this is a very important point, the possibility of historical inquiry and discovery of history is denied it, he says. So if the history as discipline, you know, something that you can study, something that you can read, is lacking, there's no evidence against the historicity of Dasein. Historicity is there, it's just not being understood as such. And the more that we attend to this fundamental category of historicity, not even category, structure, dimension, the better we're going to be at not just doing, but also receiving history. Here's where we get to a really interesting point. So we brought up tradition, right? And there's a possibility of having a kind of tradition, which would be a positive appropriation of the past, allow us full possession of the most proper possibilities of inquiry. That's not how tradition often functions, however. And this is why we can have that conception of, you know, like tradition and fiddler on the roof. You know, tradition, I have to follow it. Uh, you know, I can't think for myself. I, I have to just, you know, follow in this, this thing that's been sketched out for me and never deviates. That's one conception of tradition, but it's a degenerate understanding of tradition. Now, Heidegger here is going to talk about a tradition of what later we'll call Western metaphysics. Here he's going to call it uh, ontology. And this is a tradition that is, in many respects, really great. It's, it's what we fill our, our history of philosophy books with and, in fact, uh, rely upon in, in many of our philosophy classes without even realizing it and, uh, you know, spread throughout all sorts of medium over and over again, generation after generation, without realizing that it has become 
something restrictive, something stifling, rather than something that opens reality up to us. So he tells us Dasein not only has an inclination to get entangled in the world in which it is and to interpret itself in terms of that world, he says at the same time Dasein is entangled in a tradition which it more or less explicitly grasps. And that tradition is coming down from us from uh, you know, some original wellsprings, he says, uh, we, we, we wind up being uh, barred in our access to these original wellsprings, and we forget where all of these interpretations of being come from. You, you might at this moment also wonder, if you know anything about Martin Heidegger, why, if he thinks that all of these people are in a certain respect blocking our access to the originary insights that the Greek thinkers prior to Plato had about the nature of being, why would he bother talking about them and analyzing their ideas at such great length in being in time? Why would he give lecture after lecture on each of these modes of, of thinking? Because each of them does also contribute something, something originary, something interesting, something that reveals being more to us. But the problem is, is that they also conceal in the process. And they can become, as he'll talk about it a little bit later, uh, here we go, sclerotic, right? Uh, think about when things become hardened, things become congealed. They no longer have any sort of flexibility. So he goes on and he says... Um, at the outset, we showed that the question of the meaning of being was not only unresolved, but on, not only inadequately formulated, but that uh, it had actually been forgotten. Why? Because of this entire tradition. He says, Greek ontology and its history, which would include Plato and Aristotle, um, through many twists and turns, still define the conceptual character of philosophy today. And they are, he says, proof of the fact that Dasein understands itself in general terms of the world. So the ontology that comes down to us from the Greeks is going to get taken up eventually uh, by um, you know, the, the, the Christian thinkers uh, who introduced the notion of creation ex nihilo and a number of other things. That's going to morph into scholasticism. Uh, as as, as uh, Heidegger says, it becomes a fixed body of doctrine in the Middle Ages. And um, he also tells us, though, this is a good point, um, within the limits of its dogmatic adoption of the fundamental Greek conceptions of being, this systematics, the Christian systematics, contains a great deal of unpretentious work which does make advances. So at each point there is advances being made. But this tradition is continuing through and it's winding up with different shapes, different, different uh, uh, interpretations. Then we uh, move from the scholastic model into Descartes and eventually through Kant and Hegel. Now, what is getting misinterpreted in this entire course? If you read on through section six, you'll find him talking about um, several different things that are, that are, you might say, missing in the picture. He talks about um, Plato, right? And uh, what, what Plato was, was doing in, in his work. Uh, then Aristotle, um, he says Aristotle not, not understanding dialectic by placing it on a more radical foundation and transcending it. Um, then we get you know, the, the, the Christian thinkers. Then uh, we get Descartes. And he talks about Descartes here as having an ontological position um, that leaves out something very fundamental that Aristotle had actually talked about and the Christian thinkers had, had thought about time, temporality and thereby also historicity. Hegel at the very end of this is bringing historicity back in, but Hegel is an inheritor of this tradition, and despite his great brilliance, which Heidegger certainly uh, acknowledges at many points, he's, he's giving us a, a, a way of uh, approaching these things that is ultimately not going to be productive. It's not going to get us back to the question of being. And so what does Heidegger tell us that we need to do if we want to recover the 
dimension of historicity in, in such a way that we can actually do proper history. He says we have to destructure the history of ontology. How do we do that? By looking at these key ideas, these key ways in which Dasein understands itself and showing, as Heidegger says, the provenance, the fact that they didn't come down as ideas like manna from heaven. They didn't just emerge, you know, like Athena out of the, the you know, split head of Zeus, uh, you know, out of the, the genius of the thinker so that we can't, you know, ask about it. Um, we can get back, as Heidegger attempts to do in his many lectures and discussions, to thinking through what was it that the thinker was trying to make sense of and why did they go the way that they did. This is what is later uh, going to be uh, called quite commonly a genealogical approach, but is also called a deconstructive approach as well. And so Heidegger is advocating that we carry this out and that we do it in particular by focusing on time, temporality, and historicity. 